is ARFID, how can we spot it and what can we do to support? That is what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. Let's dive straight in. ARFID, or Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, is characterised by a limited range of food preferences, avoidance of certain textures or smells, and an unwillingness to try new foods. It can have a really significant impact on an individual's health and well-being, and it's easily confused with anorexia as it often triggers significant weight loss. But whilst there can be overlap, the two conditions are actually quite different. In ARFID, the restrictive eating patterns are motivated by sensory sensitivities, food aversions, and other factors that are unrelated to body image or weight concerns. Individuals with ARFID may experience anxiety or discomfort related to specific foods leading to their avoidance. On the other hand, anorexia is primarily driven by the desire for thinness or a fear of gaining weight. Individuals with anorexia have a strong preoccupation often with their appearance, their body size, and will often have a very distorted body image, believing that they're overweight when they're actually underweight, or in some cases that they haven't gained much muscle when perhaps they might be really incredibly lean and muscular. This tends not to be the case with ARFID sufferers. ARFID can be triggered by various factors, including sensory sensitivities, past traumatic experiences related to food, so choking incident, for example, and heightened anxiety around eating. There is a relatively high prevalence within the autistic population and amongst other people with sensory processing differences. The prevalence of avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, ARFID, varies depending on the population that we study and the criteria that we use for our diagnosis. Of course, ARFID was introduced as a distinct diagnostic category actually relatively recently in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, that's the DSM-5. So it was introduced in 2013 and this led to increased recognition and research on the disorder. Whilst precise prevalence is still being studied, probably always will be, ARFID is believed to be more common than previously thought. So current estimates suggest that ARFID may affect anywhere between 5 and 20% of children and adolescents, making it one of the most common feeding disorders in this particular age group. ARFID can also continue into adulthood, though prevalence rates in adults may be lower than in children and adolescents. It's important to note that ARFID can occur in individuals at any age and it may be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed due to its unique characteristics and the lack of awareness surrounding the disorder. Fun fact, whilst putting together this podcast made me realise that ARFID probably is my primary diagnosis rather than anorexia. Again, lots of um, kind of overlap for me and I've got some interesting theories about that, but yeah. ARFID feels a bit more familiar to me than perhaps I might have thought. Research and clinical understanding of ARFID are ongoing and as awareness grows, hopefully we'll get some more accurate prevalence rates that will become available. Okay, so we have a little bit of an idea about what ARFID is and that it may be affecting more children, young people and perhaps adults than we might have thought, but how do we spot it? So identifying the warning signs of avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, ARFID, can be crucial um, for early intervention and support. And like with so many things, if we're able to pick this up earlier, it's much, much easier to treat, to respond to, to break those cycles before they become really, truly embedded. But never lose hope with any kind of feeding and eating disorder at what Whatever point we recognise it, there is always a hope for moving towards better outcomes. But early recognition, fantastic if we can do it. So let's have a think about some of the warning signs and behaviours that you might look out for. Okay, so I'm going to share 12 of these. So number one, limited food variety. So individuals with ARFID will often have extremely limited range of foods that they are prepared to eat. They might have a repertoire of only a really tiny number of safe or familiar foods and reject most others. Number two is avoidance of certain textures. People with ARFID might have strong aversions to specific textures or consistencies of foods. They might refuse foods that are mushy or slimy or crunchy. You might see the obverse to be true as well. So for myself, I'm driven away from certain textures. So pasta for me is really incredibly difficult and right now impossible, but I love crunch. I'm really drawn towards crunchy food. I'm never more happy than when I'm chomping down on like iceberg lettuce or a celery stick. 
Number three, you might notice sensory sensitivities. So sensory issues such as heightened sensitivity to taste, to smell or to texture can contribute to food aversions. Individuals with ARFID may find certain sensory aspects of food intolerable. Number four is a lack of interest in trying new foods. So the child, the person may be resistant to trying new foods and they might exhibit significant anxiety or discomfort when presented with unfamiliar dishes. Number five, is a refusal to eat entire food groups. So some individuals with ARFID may exclude entire food groups, for example, fruits, vegetables, proteins, carbohydrates from their diet, which can lead to potential nutritional deficiencies. Number six is avoidance of social eating. People with ARFID will often, not always, but often avoid social situations involving food, such as parties, gatherings, eatings at restaurants to prevent exposure to unfamiliar food. Number seven is mealtime rituals or routines. So the individual might engage in specific rituals or routines during mealtime, such as eating foods in a particular order or needing specific utensils or dishes or not allowing their foods to touch or mix. Number eight is slow or picky eating. So an individual with ARFID may eat very slowly or display really picky eating behaviors, such as separating the food on the plate or needing the food to be prepared in a very particular way. Nine is poor growth or weight loss. So in children and adolescents, ARFID might lead to poor weight gain um, and growth. So they might not be following those usual charts for growth and it can result in nutritional deficiencies and developmental concerns. Number 10 is gastrointestinal symptoms. So some individuals with ARFID might experience discomfort such as bloating, constipation or stomach aches, which can be related to the restricted diet. Number 11 is anxiety or distress. So anxiety or distress related to food and eating is pretty common in ARFID. Individuals might experience really significant anxiety when confronted with challenging foods. And number 12 is food aversion that may have been present since early childhood. So for many people who have ARFID, these behaviours and aversions have been present for a really long time since they were very young and they might not have improved with age. Awareness and support for ARFID is improving. Um, I'm recording in the UK and it's certainly improving here. It's got a long way to go, um, but it's, it's light years on from where it was. So if you do suspect an issue, if you see those warning signs, then the first step is going to be to go and talk to your GP, um, your doctor who might monitor or make a referral to an eating and feeding team. It can take time and it's going to massively vary just depending on where you live and what's available in your region. But the good news is that there's loads that we can do in the meantime to support. So I'm going to share some practical ideas for the rest of the podcast about how you can get started supporting someone who you believe may be struggling with ARFID. Okay, so I'm going to share eight ideas here. And number one is to create a positive mealtime environment. So ensure that mealtimes are calm, as pleasant as possible and free from stress or pressure that's related to food. So we want to kind of try and chill it out a little bit, really make this as, as comfortable as we can. That's sometimes going to mean things like allowing a child to use a screen it while they're eating just in order to help them calm down and take their mind away from the anxiety related to the food. And that might not be in your idealistic vision of what a mealtime as a family looks like, but if it works, it works. We're also going to want to try and keep the vibe positive. So rather than looking for what they're not eating or what the challenges are, actually offering praise and positive reinforcement any time that the child is perhaps trying a new food or making progress, even if they're really tiny steps. Monitor carefully about where this praise um, should come um, and how positive you should keep the conversation and how focused on the actual food. Because for some people, and I'm certainly like this personally, if someone talks about what I'm eating whilst I'm eating it, it becomes almost impossible for me to continue. Continue, even if that person is praising me because they're really excited because I'm doing something that they know is really objectively hard and they want to help me. But the moment somebody notes, hey, you're eating that thing you find difficult, that's it, I'm done and I may not return to that food for some time. So go really carefully here, but try to keep the general conversation positive, upbeat. If the child finds it helpful, make it positive about the food. If not, we might return to that later and just notice quietly, hey, I saw earlier that you gave the broccoli a little bit of a taste, a little bit of a sniff. 
Smith, how did that feel for you? And, and, and so we can do that later, but at the time, just, just trying to keep it generally upbeat and positive and not drilling down into the negatives about the things they aren't eating, the things they're pushing away, or any more challenging or ritualistic behaviors around the food and the eating. Number two is about consistency when it comes to meal and snack time. So trying to establish regular meal and snack times to provide structure and predictability. So routine, reliability, familiarity, these things will all help to reduce the anxiety when it comes to food. And it can also help the body to get into a regular pattern of eating and hunger. Number three is thinking about meal planning. So actually collaborating with the child to plan meals and snacks that are based on their actual food preferences. And it is okay here to lean into the foods that the child is happy to eat. Our primary concern is just trying to take on enough calories in the first instance, often with our RFID kids. We might be looking to expand out their repertoire of foods at some point, but it's not usually our starting point. So plan based on the things that do feel safe, the things that they are prepared to eat. Even if you're looking at that as a parent, as a carer as another supporting adult and going this isn't enough different foods this isn't nutritionally balanced start where you can and we work out from there we've got to build our confidence up around food around eating building that trusting relationship with you as someone who's going to support around food before we begin to venture into other places if you go too hard too soon then what you can end up doing is actually reducing that number of foods down even further because what had felt safe begins to feel unsafe in this new kind of context and environment that we've built We might, as time goes on, begin to offer a variety of foods, um, offer a variety of the familiar and accepted foods at first, and then very gradually look to introduce new options in small portions. One thing I would suggest here is that we never make food unavailable to a child. So if we're eating, for example, as a family and the child is having their safe preferred foods, that other foods that might be eaten by other members of the family are made really readily available to the child, that they could eat them if they chose to. Always make them available because you never know the day when they might choose of their own volition to be curious, to touch a food, to smell it, to sniff it, to lick it, or even just to look at it and begin to contemplate it. This is a process when it comes to introducing new foods that can take a little while. So make them available. Don't make it clear that these foods aren't for you. Make them available for the child. And if they don't get eaten, then we take them to one side and we use them for another meal for ourselves. And that's okay. but keep them available. If the child does choose to venture near one of those foods, just remember what I was saying before about the praise. Just allow it to happen. If the child benefits really well, if you know them and you know that they're going to be really excited that you're proud of them, share that. If not, just contain your excitement and quietly allow it to happen and check in with them later and find out how it felt for them. Strategy number four is modeling healthy eating habits. So again, as ever, this comes back to us as role models for the children and young people in our care. So think about how you can set a positive example by enjoying a diverse range of foods in front of the child who is struggling. Um, And also try really hard not to make negative comments about your disliked foods or imposing your food preferences on them. It's really cool to explore the things that you do like, the textures that you enjoy, the smells, the tastes that excite you, and to explore those sensory experiences, but actually try to avoid exploring your dislikes because sometimes they will adopt them in addition to their own and their world of food shrinks ever smaller. Number five is about small steps and exposure. So think about this like any other fear where we might go through our sort of gradual exposure ladder type activities. Gradually expose the child to new foods, new smells, new tastes, new textures in a non threatening way. So start with really tiny portions. This isn't about how much nutrition they're taking on board at this point. This is about trying a new thing and that's hard and that's scary. So then if appropriate for that child, we might praise them for really simple things like looking at the food, smelling the food, touching and poking and picking at the food, tasting the food, even if they don't get anywhere near to eating it. This is one bit where parents and carers, supporting adults, we need to get our head around that it's okay to play with our food. If we're an RFID kid, we're going to encourage that playing with food. So often as adults, we find out, don't play with your food, you've just got to eat it. But for a child with RFID, they need to explore this food, they need to get familiar with it, it needs to start to feel safer for them. That's going to mean exploring what it feels like when I poke it, wondering what does it feel like when I pull it apart in my hands and then poke it with my fingers. Maybe, maybe getting really brave and licking it and seeing what it tastes like on the outside, on the inside. I might want to smell it, I might want to put it in my mouth and give it a chew and then spit it out and that's really brave too. 
all of this might be stuff that if we didn't support a child with ARFID and we weren't really keen for them to be wanting to try new foods and we didn't understand the sensory overwhelm that they may be experiencing right now or the panic and fear associated to past experiences, then we might just be thinking, come on, let's not play with our food, we're beyond this. But for your child, or indeed adult with ARFID, this exploration, this play, and actually making it a bit playful can help, is a really positive part of the process. This is the precursor to food. This is the, the pre-eating uh, kind of bit that, that can happen. And getting into some games, getting into some routines, getting into some rituals about new foods. You might do it in a certain order. You might have a song that you play or that you sing. You might keep a journal about it. You might wonder about the senses in order. You can be silly. What does it sound like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? jump in with them as well and play with the food with them too that can help as well if you're an adult that they trust number six um, is about food exploration activities so in addition to trying individual new foods on our plate actually outside of meal times we might do some like food exploration activities so we might touch or smell or generally play with food to desensitize to new textures but with no intention to eat sometimes we might do this right outside of a meal time as part of playtime trying to remove some of those fears around food trying to just get curious in the same way that we might get curious about other things so you might have a younger child who always wants to put everything in their mouth and smell it and taste it and push it and pull it introduce food in those moments so in a playtime make this okay make it not about the eating make it about the exploration of the senses number seven is to try to reduce the pressure and anxiety around food so trying to avoid pressuring the child to eat specific foods or to finish what's on their plate because this can really provoke a lot of anxiety and make it this kind of impossible hurdle to overcome. The other thing you can do here is actually to acknowledge out loud the child's feelings and their fears related to food and trying to make sure this is done completely without judgment. Um, and then number eight is I would suggest that you actually do document your progress. So keep in a food diary or journal of some kind to track the child's eating habits, their preferences and any changes over time. And then you can use this to celebrate achievements and milestones in their eating journey. It's also a super helpful document for you to have if you do end up seeking, engaging with any kind of professional support. This journal, this diary of what you've tried, how it's going, the challenges that you're having to overcome, the barriers, what the child can't eat, how much they're taking on board. All this kind of evidence can be really helpful um, presented to your GP, to your doctor or to a practitioner within the feeding and eating disorders team if you get that far. Um, but then it, it does become this really helpful kind of guide for you through your journey. You can look at what did work. You played a particular game. Oh, this particular piece of music seemed to really calm things down. Oh, well, on this day, actually, we went for a walk directly before we ate and that seemed to make it just a little bit easier for them to feel calm enough to eat engage with the meal noticing just being an observer a little bit and being a bit curious about what's going on noticing noting reflecting learning that, that documentation that journaling process can be incredibly helpful here the other thing is it can help you to notice progress that you might have otherwise missed. Progress here will often look really tiny and we might not notice it if we've not been actually specifically documenting it. But if we have been really kind of looking, noting, reflecting, then we might see that small bit of progress and that can help to boost us and encourage us to kind of stick with it and to keep going. So this is kind of for us as well as for the child. Remember though that progress can feel really slow and the journey of each child with ARFID is going to be unique. Patience, empathy and understanding are things you're going to need by the bucket load as you work together to support your child in developing this healthier relationship with food. If you have got concerns about your child's nutritional status or their overall well-being, then do consider seeking professional help from your doctor or indeed actually talking to someone at school and asking for the best route into appropriate support. They'll often know where to point you and maybe be able to support you a little bit along the way too. Okay, as we wrap up, remember that ARFID is a really complex condition and it's one we don't really understand enough yet, but we're working on it. But with patience, with empathy and with some of the right strategies, positive changes are possible for you and your child. Remember, you're not alone on this journey and if you're listening to this and you're worried about yourself or another adult, 
you're not alone there either. Much of what I've talked about today can be adapted and applied to adults, though our understanding of ARFID in adults is even more limited than it is in children. It's seen very much as a childhood kind of thing, but then so was autism until recently, right? I'm hoping to learn more. I've got very strong motivations for that. So do reach out if this is something that's affecting you, if you've got thoughts uh, and ideas along the way. Um, just as a, a small aside here, my current pet theory, which when I'm well enough, which I'm not right now, um, I want to go and explore is that I think for me personally, so I'm an autistic adult with a long history of anorexia, um, but I've been well for a few years, had a massive dip just recently. And I think the problem is that I struggle with ARFID all the time. Food is always a challenge for me. I never got that beautiful recovery that people talk about with eating disorders. Every meal's always been hard, um, but I've stuck with it. I've kept my weight healthy and then suddenly it's just fallen off a cliff edge recently. I think that for me, what happens is that I'm managing ARFID most of the time. Then when I reach a point of autistic burnout, I no longer have the, the kind of the, the mental bandwidth to do the managing that I need to do around food every meal time. It's really, really hard. When I lose the ability to manage every meal time, my weight just decreases really rapidly. I'm a really active person. Um, and when my weight decreases, then I believe what happens is that anorexic thinking begins to kick in in my brain below a certain point. There's interesting research I'd love to look at it more, but about things that happen to people when they become emaciated. So the response of um, survivors of concentration camps, for example, um, and their thoughts and um, feelings and beliefs around food for not just at the time, but actually sometimes for many, many years later. Um, and I think that that thinking, that starved brain thinking is, is part of what drives the anorexia for me. So it switches from being off it, this kind of sensory kind of just general fear around food for me into being something which is weirdly driven by weight and that obsessional behavior um, that comes with anorexia and that inner voice that tells me that I don't deserve to eat and all that kind of thing. But it kind of kicks in at a certain point. However, I have always only ever had treatment for anorexia because A, I've not really even thought about ARFID as a potential diagnosis, but B, you only tend to enter treatment at a point when your weight is really low. And for me then anorexia is very much present. So I'm hoping if I could learn to understand ARFID, in adults a bit more that I might be able to manage myself better in future. However, I need to get out of the current hole uh, first of all. So um, I'll do that. And then if there are people out there who are interested to explore this, yeah, do reach out, reach out. It's a, it's a complicated thing. Anyway, I hope that within today's podcast that there were some helpful ideas for you. Um, if you did like what you heard today, then please do subscribe and share my work. You can support my work further by joining me over on Patreon, where you get access to my resources early and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, and I can do this either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for all the things that you are doing every day for the children and young people in your care. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knight-Smith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over and out. Mm -hmm.